Hi, Piper. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. No, so Amber filled you. me in a little bit, but I'm all yours. How can I no, help you? No, no, thank you very much. I basically Australia, like in Australia, you can't find anything about bioactive enclosures. Yeah, I've done so much research. The only thing I literally can find is your page. <laughs> it's it's we pretty get, bad. Yeah, I get probably 20 emails a week from Australia. Oh my People gosh. Asking. Yeah, UK. Australia, can, uh, my biggest one's Canada. So yeah. I've been trying to get phytosanitary certificates so like I can ship my dirt to places besides uh, United States. It's just, it is very, very hard to work with the USDA during a pandemic. Yeah. And secondly, like just because it's a government agency in the United States, um, yeah. it's, it's a joke. So I can imagine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have yeah. to, you know, take it a step at a time but yeah definitely yeah. um yeah there's just there's not a lot of information out there at all and I'm guessing it's the same for you guys over there there wouldn't be a lot of shops like you guys at all over there yeah when I first started my business I was literally the only guy um yeah. I've created I'm not saying that I did this, but I know that my business has had a significant role with changing how our hobby is here in the United States, because now there's my, I call them quote unquote competitors of like poison dart frog breeders that have been selling the ABG mix forever. And now they're trying to get into like what I'm doing, which is funny because they didn't come up with that. Yeah, um, but because you guys have end, everything, like you guys have like the full kits where you literally just buy a kit and then it will, yeah, like that will set up the whole terrarium for that animal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But honestly, for us, we don't really care who sells it as long as they sell it right and do it right. Yeah, because we've had a lot of people try to do what we do and they're selling junk, and yeah. that is completely counterintuitive to our goal. This is an example. A lot of that comes from bad husbandry or an immunocompromised yeah. animal. So if you if you put a sick animal on bio, like you know, your animal might not be alive for yeah, very, exactly. very long. You know, exactly. it just depends. Yeah. But you know, um, that's why we're here. You know, that's why some of the other businesses here in the United States are here to try to, you know, there's a really good brand in the UK um, that might reach Australia. I don't know. It's called Arcadia Reptile. Okay. Um, John, Court John Courtney Smith, he's, he's one of my, like, you know, people that I follow and stuff. And, yeah. you know, um, he's a very inspirational human being for trend setting a standard of care uh -huh. for our animals. And that's, yeah. again, that's, that's what, that's what we do here at BioDude. We're not, we are a business, you know, we are, I am in it to have a career to support my family, but my team's mission statement is to you know, is just to make sure that we have an ascertainable standard of care that is hobby wide. Yeah. So that yeah. way they're not treated as disposable animals, animals that can be kept without no light or whatever. They're actually wild animals that need a very specific care. And like I always tell people, these aren't, these aren't for, these animals aren't, if you have a job that you can barely afford to pay your bills, reptiles are not pets for you. No. They are a, they are a luxury pet. And I say yeah. luxury pet because they need such specialized care, yeah. you know, and it's just, that's been missing from our like community for a long time, yeah, at least in the States. From, yeah. Well, from everything that I've seen, like everybody that I have seen, even on like Facebook groups that have reptiles, all of it is like, when people oh, yeah. ask like yeah when people ask like what's a what's a low costing animal that I can get everybody always says reptiles and I'm like I one I don't even think that that is possibly yeah. like I don't think you can ever say an animal is low costing oh. because they yeah. all have their own individual mm -hmm. needs yeah well that I feel like that comes from and this is how the business is you know you have these importers yeah. in Florida in California going out to Florida, Everglades, catching stuff, you know, selling bailed chameleons to wholesalers at 15 bucks a piece for a wild caught adult. You know, you have people selling baby Nile monitors to these mega wholesalers that are then selling Nile monitors to little kids. So 
it kind of starts back at yeah. the beginning. Some really good people, like there are really good private breeders that are like taking big strides and like stopping the spread, uh, or not spread, but stopping like how much of specific things are being imported because wild caught demand goes down, captive yeah. demand goes up. But there are some species that it's imperative that you still bring in wild caught genetics to maintain the the captive line yeah. because eventually that line is going to get so muddled the mixture as I like to put it to when you can start having just issues yeah definitely okay, I am 32 yeah. I have been doing this I have been huge into the creators since I was about nine but I didn't actually get my first one that I was allowed to like I snuck them in all the time like newts salamanders my parents didn't yeah. support it right away but yeah when I got when my when I was like 12 I think my mom bought me a leopard gecko mm -hmm. and then I got a beer dragon and then that's when like my love for the outdoor animals really started coming into like yeah. the whole captive thing and I can tell you back then my options were like carpet eco worth or yeah. um actually I don't even know if it was eco worth then might have been and just aspen or cedar cedar was a huge one and i was like oh my god no because i i think i used cedar like when i was really young like once and then i was like then i learned i was like oh you can't use this stuff it can kill your animals because of the oils yeah. in it so uh, I, I love them and i just i really hated just going to the shows and just seeing people just recklessly selling little kids chameleons and, yeah. you know, selling, you know, selling a family a boa constrictor. I'm like, you know, you're all you're doing is setting us back. Yeah. And that's just, you know, with how this hobby is, you get a reptile keeper and you want to breed it. That's just kind of seems to be what happens. And yeah. a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes you can have people that do that. They don't put the knowledge into it because they're wild animals yeah. they're healthy or not they're going to breed in some cases not all the yeah. time but sometimes yeah. and i just it's gotten better but there's still a lot more room for improvement but there's been a lot of niche businesses a lot of niche businesses that have really really made a difference here in the states in the united kingdom i don't again i, I can't speak for like australia but there are <laughs> some brands there are some brands out there that are really trying to make a difference and then there's other brands out there that have existed for as long as I've been alive, yeah. the companies, but their names kind of, their names have changed as they progress and they aren't providing, they are still stuck in 1970, yeah. 1980, 1990 for reptile care. You know, at the end of the day, if you can get 25 animals to be kept the way that they're supposed to be kept, well, that's 25 animals that have a chance. Yeah, exactly. That's, 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 that's honestly how... I look at everything on a grand scale for every customer that I sell something that I created when it comes to this, I say, well, you know, regardless if they listen to me or not, if they're using it, if they went and bought a, bought a wild caught animal, you know, and they yeah. don't know anything about worming or rehydrating, but they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. You know, at least if they're on my stuff and that animal is somewhat outwardly healthy, not immunocompromised, you know, that animal has a chance instead yeah. of, a wild caught animal being put on EcoWorth. Yeah. Or I shouldn't say EcoWorth. EcoWorth is not a bad product when used if it's changed regularly or used with a little bit. ZooMed makes great stuff. I'm not. I'm not saying nothing bad about yeah. ZooMed. It because it's self sustaining, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. For yeah, for the most part, as long as you maintain it right, you know, it's all about symbiotic relationships. So you with my kits, I don't include the springtails and isopods because it's not scalable. You know, you can't ship springtails and isopods year round. You almost have to ship them overnight. And I got, and I'm not going to put stuff in a box knowing it's going to come in dead. That's not how I do business. Yeah. So that's why we came up with the Bioshock, which is just, again, it's just a, a microbial bacterial inoculant to jumpstart your symbiotic relationships, as well as get the nitrogen cycle going, get all of those things that happen on a microbiological level in your soil happening. So that way, when you put in your cleanup crew, like your earwigs or your springtails, or your yeah. isopods or your superworms or your mealworms or what, whatever the heck you want to use, you know, all of those relationships are going to work together. And then that's how you get the true bio self, mainly self-cleaning, self-maintaining, 
you know, you have to top off biodegradables once in a while, but it doesn't yeah. take away your husbandry of your animal. You still have to miss, you still have to feed, you still have to make sure that they have clean water, you know, yeah. and you still want to make sure that your animal's shedding respiration and hydrating appropriately, because those are three pivotal things with keeping them healthy. But, you know, it does, it streamlines the process, it nourishes enrichment, it provides them to act like wild animals that they yeah. are. And would you rather spend $2,000 over the course of the animal's life or $500 yeah. on yeah. the stuff that you need? Exactly. And then that's the best way to ask yourself if going that direction is best for you. The, the thing about having, having animals is that it, it shouldn't really be about convenience for us. And I feel like it, the, the whole animal industry, I guess, has turned to what is convenient for us. And I think at the end of the day, like it is a responsibility. It is like having a child. Like if you get a dog, that's like having a child. You're going to have to take care of that, that dog or yep. having a reptile. You're going to be expected to be able to maintain their enclosures and yep. to, to be able to provide everything that they need. So it, it shouldn't be about convenience. It should be about how we possibly can make their lives better in captivity. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Would you be able to tell us why bioactive is important because probably a lot of people don't even know what bioactive yeah, is. Yeah, of course. So, you know, bio, so the term bioactive has been around for like a lot longer than I've been alive. I just kind of, I just used it to create a name to what needs to happen. Okay. Yeah. Essentially, it's important because bioactive just means I like to say self cleaning, self maintaining. The self cleaning is just a bonus for you. What is most of this is the best way that I like to put it. I had people tell me, bio dude, you know, my bearded dragon's going to eat some sand. It's going to get impacted or it's going to eat some of the dirt. It's going to get impacted and it's going to die. I look at those people and I say, okay, reptiles are wild animals. Would you agree? And they say, yeah, you know, they're not domesticated. Like, yeah, they're not domesticated. So you're telling me that a wild animal, if it ingests a little bit of sand, a little bit of dirt, is going to die of infection. Now, if that's the case, do you really think that animal would survive in the wild for us to be able to pull it out and have it as a pet? <laughs> and those people usually look at me like, okay. And that right there is what I'm getting at is the wild animal. They are not dogs. They are not cats. They yeah. have very, very, very specific requirements because their physiological structure is entirely different than, any, than almost any other animal on the planet. Yeah. And it's important that, you know, like us, they need the sun and every reptile is from a different part of the world. So it's very important that with their environment that you're providing the right type of, of UVB and heat because these are wild animals. They have natural instincts that make them unique as animals. Yeah. Let's 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 look at a at the mossy leaf tail geckos, the Europlatus genus from Madagascar. They utilize their cryptic coloring to completely blend into their environment. That is how they keep their stress levels down. It's how they hunt. It's how they disguise mm -hmm. themselves from predators. Let's say you go somewhere and you buy a Europlatus lizard as a pet. Mossy leaf tail gecko as a pet. And you can do that. You bring this critter home. You, you give it dirt and you put a couple sticks in there and that's it. If you are not providing the surface area and color for that animal to use its natural instincts to blend in, that animal is going to get stressed out. That yeah. animal is not going to do well for you. And yeah. when you have a bioactive enclosure, when you can have live plants growing in the enclosure, when you can do things like that, that nurtures that natural instinctual niche behavior that makes these animals so unique in the first place. Like number two, a chameleon. We know that most chameleons not all, they live in the trees, a veiled chameleon. Yeah. So what I tell people is, you know, I want you to plant a legitimate tree in their enclosure. Not a fake one, not sticks. I want you to put a legitimate tree in there because yeah. to them, that is what you need. And if you, you can't just put a tree with a pot in their enclosure and expect it to do well, like you physically have to plant it, you have to put substrate in there. And that's where your bio is going to come into play. Yeah. If you just have a if you just have a chameleon with no tree and just a couple sticks and a bunch couple hanging vines in there, do you really think that chameleon is going to be happy and healthy yeah. enough to act like its original wild self? Yeah. And yeah. 
that I tell people is if it's a wild animal, the one thing that makes reptiles so cool is because of how different they are. Yeah. If you are going to have a reptile as a pet, what's the point of having it if you're not going to give it the stuff to make it do its cool, cool <laughs> behaviors yeah. in the tank? Then yeah. what's the point of having it? Yeah, it's there always isn't. setting them up for failure. Yeah, that's that's a very good way to put it. Yeah, definitely. When it, when it comes to, obviously, substrates, do you believe that quality matters? Absolutely. So um, when I say quality matters, I like to look at quality can be distinguished as a few things. Functionality, how long it lasts, its application, um, and ingredients. Okay. Yeah. Um, and all of that is, it, it's going to be different for everybody. There are so many deep do it yourself mixes out there for bioactive. Some of those might work for some people while some of them might not work for others, okay. you know, and it, you, what you also have to look at is your environment, yeah. like your environment outside, let's say, um, so I'm, I live in Texas right now in the United States and Texas is the bottom middle of the United States where I'm originally from is a state called Pennsylvania. Yeah. That state is in the Northeast of, of the United States and it gets freaking cold and dry where yeah. Texas is hot and humid. So some of the substrate mixes that I would try to use, like when I was a long time ago that I would try to use in Pens that I would use in Pennsylvania yeah. to emit more humidity in my house because it was always so freaking dry during the winter functioned yeah. great. But I took that same mix down to Texas and tried using it and I couldn't use it because yeah. I couldn't get my humidity values low enough because the humidity in Texas is so freaking wet. So it's not just okay. When you're looking at your substrates and what you're using and X, Y, and Z, it's not just your ingredients. It is what, how are your yeah. ingredients going to be functioning and what type of environment and what changes are you going to need to make in the microclimate that you're making in yeah. comparison to the massive climate that's surrounding the entire enclosure. Does that make sense? Wow. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So is that the same with oh. water? Because I know that a lot of people just use tap water. Tap water. So water is not all equal. That's the best way I like to put it. So at my personal home, like city water has a lot of metals and chlorine and stuff like that in it. Yep. So I have like a special reverse osmosis unit, water okay. softening unit. And that's what we use for my animals here in house. I actually have a water company called Sparklets that delivers these giant five gallon water dispensers. Okay. And I get, I get 30 of them every two weeks. So yeah, um, you good. know, they, so it, it is important, you know, there are, um, there are like some products out there that you can just drop into tap water to make it safe, but that is just a chemical. Oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's, like, I, but I you're, just adding, it and, you're just adding more chemicals into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're adding like a salt-based chemical to yeah. neutralize your chloramines and chlorides and your, some of your metals to help with taste or to help with alle alleviating some of the stuff. So water is really important, but honestly, at the end of the day, reptiles are pretty, I, I hate saying hardy because some of them are and some of them definitely are not, Yeah. but a lot of them are designed to be able to intake not the cleanest of water and have the GI ability to be able to just deal with it. So, yeah. So obviously being healthy that they would be able to, to deal with it. Exactly. Exactly. Because again, water in nature is not clean. Yeah. It's yeah. not clean. Again, you know, even though you're dealing with captive bred animals, you know, they still have a natural gut biome, yeah, definitely. just like we do. You know, you know, I like to. Uh, we get questions on people wanting to mix species. Can I put my red eye tree frog with a green tree frog? And I say no, because the natural gut biome in a frog from Costa Rica is completely different than the natural gut biome. You know, they're all different, but they can still share some things than one in like United States. And sometimes they can have a re an adverse reaction. Right. to each other which then can make them sick who do use 
tiles and paper towels is is commonly used as well. Um, I know paper yep. towels is used in um, like quarantine enclosures. Yep. Would you recommend yep. that or would you recommend? So I so it depends. So if it's a fossorial species, no, I won't use paper towels, but I do substrate changes every day. So okay. if I get a wild caught, let's say I get a wild, some wild caught amphibian. So I, I've bred probably about 22 or 23 different species of tree frogs in my yeah. life. Many different species of dart frogs, lizards and stuff, but frogs are always my specialty, but frogs can carry chytrid carry ranavirus, they can carry yeah. a lot of nasty worms. So when I get what I, if I would bring in a group of frogs from Costa Rica, which has happened a couple times, you know, I bring those frogs in, I set them up in a tank with, with paper towels or moist triple A sphagnum moss. Okay. If those frogs are looking really, really rough, like rough, I use paper towels and every single day I'm making sure those paper towels are wet. Those paper towels are changed every day that the, the, the tank is disinfected every day. Yeah. And those frogs follow a strict worming procedure of panicure and metronazole throughout the course of a uh, month. Then they get tested for chytrid and the ranavirus during that quarantine period. And then after that period, I put them in, tra in straight triple A sphagnum moss, which is just you know, your yellow fluffy yeah. moss. Yeah. See how they do with that for, for about a week or two, changing it every couple of days. Yeah. Then I put them on bio once I know they're clean. Okay. So, but if you're dealing, if I'm dealing with a Pac-Man frog, okay, a Pac-Man frog, they're a pastoral frog, which means they like to burrow. They do not like to be out. They don't like to be exposed. They like to have their fat bodies completely under the dirt and leaves. Yeah. For a critter like that, I will just use sphagnum moss in the quarantine process and I will, you know, utilize and then I will change out that moss every day, every other day okay. yep. to make sure they don't reinfest themselves with whatever I'm trying to do. With work. whatever you're trying to get rid of. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of commercial bearded dragon breeders that keep their beardies on tile. You know, if that's what works for them and their critters are breeding and they're happy and healthy, you know, I mean, I'm not going to shame them. I would love to see them, you know, use substrate, you know, they're using yeah. laying boxes, um, you know, so the girls can lay their eggs, but I just, bearded dragons don't live on tile, yeah. you know, and they say, well, they have coccidia or they have pinworms, they have other things that they can keep re 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 uh, reinfesting themselves, Yeah, but you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. My wife, my wife is a, is a, is, is a uh, hurt vet. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, we just routinely deworm our animals every year. Yeah. That's just what we do. You know, all my animals in my showroom, they get wormed every year. Yeah. All of my, you know, quarantine animals, you know, they get, I just make that a habit. So to me, if you like are just practicing that, I don't, I, but again, I'm not a bearded dragon breeder. I am not an expert on coccidia. I am not an expert on, no. you know, on pinworms, but I know what has worked for me and yeah. I know what has worked for my consumers yeah. that I work with. So. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely. Would you say that? Because obviously if you are going to get a reptile or amphibian, research is definitely necessary in order to be able yes. to provide. Yes. I, husbandry. It really sucks when I have to deal with people that come to me with a ready or slider and I tell them that it's going to get, you know, bigger than a large dinner plate and they're going to need a small pond or a minimum of a 125 gallon tank, which is still going to be too small. And they, and, and they just bought it for their, for their six-year-old kid. And it's just, yeah. that is why research is so pivotal. Because yeah. so many animals die in this industry from people not giving a crap and just they see it, they buy it, they expect it can live in a fauna area with this much water, or yeah. they buy an anole, a little green lizard that we have here in the States, you know, and they put it in a little fauna area and mm -hmm. they hope with no light, you know, and, and think that's just okay. And yeah. it's just, but again, that goes back to what I was saying earlier with. There are some people that serve our demographic that do not carry that high ethical or moral standard 
that regresses us back. And that's how, and that's just how it's been. Yeah. And that's why it's super important for businesses, legitimate businesses that have brand power to work together to change, to change that. And um, if someone was setting up an enclosure in general, whether that be for reptile or amphibian, what would be the top things that you would suggest they avoid or even just to look out for? And from what I've seen from some of these brands here in the States, yeah. the UVB bulbs mm. that don't produce any UVB or the, you know, or wow. like the, some of the, some of the substrates that can cause severe respiratory issues with animals if oh. they're used in the way that they're being intended to use. It's just, but that's just, that's just how it is. So what I like to tell people is a couple of things. I tell, if it's a tropical animal, I tell them that if they're using straight coconut choir, uh, to make sure that they change it out routinely every two to three weeks. Yeah. Um, and I, to stay away from is I tell them to stay away from, um, you know, on social media, there's a lot of different like reptile groups and other things like, like on that, Maybe. like we have a group, like mm -hmm. Biodune started a group for people to go to and ask questions and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, it's there, but there's a lot of wrong information. So if you're going to, I tell people that if you're going to pull info off the internet, you need to double check yourself yeah. and make sure you're not getting it from somebody who has no idea what the heck they're talking about because yeah. that is everywhere. Yeah. So misinformation is a big thing that people need to be concerned about. Number yeah. two is before they purchase products, they should, again, do research on those products to make sure it's what's actually recommended out there because again there's a lot of products that are available that do absolutely nothing yeah for the animals yeah at all i tell people to stay away from reptocarpet yeah. or not reptocarpet like the carpet i don't know whatever whatever like it's the carpet that you roll out for lizards with yep. uh mm. with toenails they can rip out their nails yeah. it's just no. it doesn't help with respiration shedding and humidity um, it doesn't allow them to burrow. It's just, it's not good. Um, and then I tell people if they're going bioactive to do not use fake plants because yeah. their cleanup crew can eat the plants right. um, and, and, or things like that. And then that can, or like crickets, you know, if you have a, a carnivore and you have fake, if you have some fake plants in there, I have seen crickets eat nylon material and plastic material that then your animal is then eating and ingesting that material. Yeah. After that. Um, and then the, then I always tell people to make sure that they uh, are comfortable with their lighting and to have everything um, on a timer. Okay. So a lot of people like to rely on just turning things on and turning things off themselves in the morning, like the heat bulb, the UVB bulb, the plant bulb. And I tell people, if you want to do that, that's okay. But if you really want to get your reptiles cycled, so schedule is key. Yeah. Let me tell you that schedule is key with these critters. And if you have them on a timer that you keep it consistent, you'll get a lot more positivity on the back end from them. Yeah. Then just so one morning you turn the lights on at eight. The next morning you got to work that day, so you turn them on at five thirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. While that might not be a big deal to us, photo period for them is everything. Yeah. It's everything. Definitely, definitely. Would you say that bioactive provides enrichment for them as well? Could really good example of that is okay. Uh, let's say you use you know, you get some, some desert substrate, whether it's from me or whoever, okay? Yeah. You have a bearded dragon. I always, whenever somebody buys a bearded dragon or needs something, I give them the list of healthy edibles. So I sell some. So what you can do for herbivores and omnivores is you can literally plant things that they can eat in the tank. So yeah. it nourishes the act of foraging, all that good stuff. So let's say you have like a beardy, okay? Or a tortoise. And you want to plant some rosemary, some basil, hibiscus. You can literally plant that stuff in the tank and have it grow. Yeah. Like and so, and one and some of my enclosures at, at outside and at home, there is literally small hibiscus shrubs growing in that enclosure. And my tortoise, his name's Butthead. He's a pancake <laughs> tortoise. 
when those hibiscus flower into the big red or pink flowers, he literally takes his slow little butt up there and eats the flowers straight off the plant. Wow. And that is him going out on himself to do that. Beardies, you know, you can put plants in there that you know they're going to get completely destroyed, but it's it's literally allowing them it's to giving rip them something food. off out of the ground. Yeah. Yes. And that yeah. is very, very important. I have seen keepers use treat balls for your somewhat more intelligent lizards like green tree monitors, uh, that's a great example in putting like a pinky mouse in the very middle or like some, or like some rapashi food, mm -hmm. um, in the middle. And they actually have to solve, I hate saying solve a puzzle, but they have to roll it to get it to the very particular opening that they, their mouth will only fit in to get to that thing. To and yeah. if they are doing it, if they're actively using it, if they're actively trying to get into it, they're getting something out of it. Yeah. You know, regardless of how nominal it may be, you're still providing some brain stimuli yeah. to a wild caught to a wild animal that's in a glass box. Yeah. My emerald tree skinks, you know, they they learn from you know, from, from different types of conditioning. So operant conditioning to provide something to get a particular, you provide a stimuli to get um, a type of response. So what we started doing with the emeralds when they were younger is we go up to their cage and we stand there and let them come out to us. And we did that a couple times a day for a couple months. Yeah. Then, then when they were starting, starting to come, come up to us and building the trust, we would, we would then put, put our hands out to have them come up and talk with us or oh. talk with us to kind of hang out with us. And now we got them to the point when we walk up to the cage because we started feeding them like, like yeah. worms and things like that after as the reward. So we got both of my groups to the point when we can go up to their cage, each one goes to a very particular ledge in the cage and they wait there. We can have the cage door open for five minutes and they will not move until we walk up and we put the worm right in front of their face and they delicately take it out of my hand one by one by one wow. now these animals were captive bred but these are still wild animals that they have to live in groups these groups form a lead in the cage that there's a typical dominance between females and males that's a struggle they breed within the cage. There's eggs incubating in the cage. We yeah. show up and there's babies in the cage. And, you know, that goes to show you that, like, you know, they can, with the right type of conditioning, they can, you can get different things out of them. So there is a level of intelligence yeah. there that needs to be looked at because just because it's not intelligence like what we have, yeah. it doesn't mean that the type of intelligence that they have is any lesser than ours Definitely. in fact it could be it could be you know you know i shouldn't say lesser than ours it obviously is to an extent but it's so unique and different yeah that it you know you have to give them something to utilize that yeah, definitely. In an active environment. Definitely. So, would you say that bioactive is like the first step, I guess, in in providing that for them? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I would say, you know, whether it's the first step or the third step, but you know, it's it, it's definitely an important factor. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Um, because some things for you, like your your grazers, you know, grassland grazers and things like that. That's you know, it's just super important to make sure that you're able to put grass seed or grass in their enclosure. So yeah. that way, if you want to provide them an area to roam, if they're too small to go outside, you know, it just gives you options. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, well, thank you so much for, for this. I really do appreciate it. I think it's, I think it's great to be able to talk about it because um, there's, and I guess I am speaking on behalf of everyone, but like, personally, I don't think that there is enough stuff out there about it. And like I said, the only page that I've come across with trusted information was you guys and those videos that you guys awesome. post so I really yeah. appreciate that yeah so I think it was really important to be able to get in touch with you just to be able to talk about it because that's not to say that nobody in Australia does bioactive or, or anything like that that's that's not to say that at all um because I'm I'm sure that there's many people out there that do um but I just know from a 
from what I've yeah, seen. Absolutely. But it's just no, like, I, not out there. I no, I completely understand. And you know, we're trying, I said that that's our mission statement here. It's just give these critters the chance they yeah. deserve. Yeah, definitely. A lot of times they don't got a chance. No. Thank you so much for this. I really do appreciate you taking the time out. Time yep. out to talk to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, 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 was, it was my pleasure. And thank you for calling me all the way from Australia. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed. I, I, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and I hope you guys stay safe.